Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you all here. Sorry for being late as always, but yeah, you you should know me know me by now. I would almost say a long time no see, which is kind of true. But um yeah, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome everyone. Welcome RS Aurelian, nice to see you. Always saw some interesting questions. And Okay, an interesting bug. That is that will be interesting. My mouse wheel is not working. So I can't scroll up chat. That is a problem. I found a solution. Maybe I have to restart my window here. But yeah, welcome everyone. Hope you had a fantastic day. We didn't stream in a long time, unfortunately. So I try to stream more often now here on YouTube again. And also, um, with somebody who said greetings from uh, Bloom Fountain. I'm not even sure. Maybe it's maybe it's pronounced uh, Bloom Fountain or something like this. Um, South Africa. I have one simple question: Is it possible that Mongolian was created by Eru? I think that's very likely, in my opinion, because is there really a possibility that something can exist in Tolkien's universe that is not created by Eru? Even Morgos is created by Eru, so I would argue the same could be true for Ongolian. The reason why she is created, though, could also have to do with Morgos, so... though. It's an interesting idea that she could also, like, she's a pr primordial entity representing the void. Interesting, but it's very cool that you are actually from South Africa for people maybe not familiar with the name um, That is the the birthplace of Tolkien interestingly We go I hope sound is good by the way, please let me always know if the um, the sound is good and um, Yeah, search in genera uh, January 1892 in the Bloemfontein. It's uh, kind of interesting. Sounds good, awesome. Hey there, brother of Crin, nice to see you here as well. Hope you are doing well. It's very nice to have like another live stream here. I always feel a bit rusty. I did a lot of gaming content recently. So just uh, in case people wondering, just I think yesterday I uploaded a new video to the gaming channel, which is about pa cyberpunk and past racing. So maybe a very technological um, specific topic that's not interesting for everybody, but uh, I felt like making a video about this. So if you're wondering what is Chris doing all the time, I did a lot of gaming content um, previously. So that is currently what uh, I'm doing quite a bit. Oh, I see, I feel being rusty at writing. I haven't done much writing lately. I'm sure you'll bounce back and do as great as always. Well, uh, I'm potentially a bit rusty in Tolkien's live streams when you don't have the uh, preparation time for it. So that's definitely a thing. <laughs> Is there no AI assistant moderator who collects the questions for you and uh, queues them? Uh, not yet, but usually it's not that big of a problem. I feel like it's not like we have three thousand viewers here that all post questions. I wouldn't be able to answer all of them anyway. My simple question is: What happens if I open the window again? Okay, now it works. That's good. So I can just close the other one. <sighs> YouTube just asked me to verify that it's really me. That means I have to enter my password and also verify using a code um, via, my, via my phone. So yeah, <laughs> it's awesome doing this in a live situation. Hey, Mr. Google, send me your text message fast. Because currently I can't read chat. <laughs> uh, oh, always awesome. Oh, that must be the code I already.
Okay, that should work. So yeah, we're going into um, some questions. As always, it's here like a uh, law Q&A so you can ask questions. I try to answer them. I can promise I won't be able to answer every question. If, you're, if I ignore your question for a moment for whatever reason, feel free to post it simply again. Oh, Otaku Senpai is here as well. I'm joining a bit late because um, I'm finished some, uh, finishing some housework. Well, no problem. We didn't do anything yet. I just tried to promote my cyberpunk past racing video <laughs> a moment ago. I can post it in chat again. I need to update the chat command for that. That's something I wanted to do before the stream started, but I simply forgot. But uh, maybe... I'm not even sure yet. Potentially also... Oh. Cloudbot is not activated. That is, of course, unfortunate. And this thing is set to the wrong language for whatever reason. Range things happening. So maybe that now it should work in chat. Maybe we should stick. No, we, we can just go all the questions. If I can't answer something, I will just say so and just move on. But I think my law knowledge is pretty good. I think it's even better than my linguistic knowledge, to be fair. Oh, you even visited um, his father's grave a few years back. Oh, that's interesting. It would also definitely a place um, I would also potentially... If I would ever visit South Africa, that is. I might also put it on the list of places to visit, I think. It would be very interesting um, to see the birthplace of Tolkien. Unfortunately, I was never in South Africa. My mother was, I think, once or even twice. I'm not sure. But she's not into Tolkien, so <laughs> she did not visit that. Okay, at least my scrolling from here. Primal, one, two, three, nice to see you here as well. Okay, so let's try answering some questions already. The first one I kind of uh, liked. But yeah, let's talk about... Uh, the, the first question was by uh, Nolorin. Um, the Hobbit, in The Hobbit, Bilbo asks Gandalf if there are other wizards. How is it that wizards aren't common and yet everybody knows what a wizard is? That's a very interesting uh, question. Already. And can humans be wizards? It's a follow-up question to that, uh, that. I try to bring it on the screen. Just give me a moment to get my production nonsense here going. Uh. I haven't done this here in, in a moment or two. So people know what we are talking about. Always helpful. I hope this kind of works. Maybe we try to not block our elven friend from Merkwood too much. No, that's the part missing of the question. Okay, so this question is a kind of a classic, but I always like talking about the East study and the wizards. So that's um, a pretty uh, good one, in my opinion, to start off. And I feel confident to kind of answer this. Otaku Senpai already um, wrote something um, to that, which I agree on. So um, yeah, let us dive into this specific question right at the beginning. So of course, for that, um, you mentioned um, that there are multiple sources for the withered things. I think the there's the Istari um, essay in Unfinished Tales, and I think there's also a passage in the Silmarillion. Let me just see if I find it, because just reading the stuff is always easier.
So there are Tolkien's ideas of the wizards changed a little bit in some details over time that for sure for example when the wizards arrive or the east study arrive is always um a big um a, 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 big, a big topic for example in the Silmarillion we can we uh, we can read um of these kurunir that saruman was the eldest and came first and after him came misrandir and radagast and now comes an interesting se- s- s- um, side sentence. And others of the East study who went into the east of Middle Earth and do not come into these tales. The ref- these others are two, and these are the Blue Withers. We also know from the Lord of the Rings. Let me just think. How was this? Uh, Saruman says, I suppose, and the crowns of the seven kings and the rods of the five wizards, and have purchased yourself a pair of boots many sizes larger than those that you wear now. That is what Saruman says to Gandalf. And he kind of leaks that there are five wizards, and at least they have rods of the five wizards. Five wizards is even spelled in capital letters, so um, it seems kind of important. This is from Lord of the Rings, a qu- direct quote. So this kind of always indicates that there are five with it. So the question as a result is very interesting. As um, Otaku Senpai um, though mentioned, there was potentially the idea that um, there might have been others, maybe more. Even as the first shadows were felt in Mirkwood, there appeared in the west of Middle-earth the East Study, who men called the Wizards. None knew that uh, time when they came save Círdan of the Havens, and only Elrond and Galadriel did he reveal that they came over the sea. Let me just see if there's enough. They journeyed right among the elfin men and held converse also with beasts and birds, and the peoples of Middle-earth gave them many names of their true names they did not reveal. Chief among them, then we come to the section I just read. And maybe somebody knows, I think in the Silmarillion there's is another sentence that kind of almost indicates that there could have been more than um, f- multiple more wizards. Let's try to um, scan through this here. I currently don't find the exact line, but maybe it was also others went to the east or something like this. So definitely th- there is more to this. However, this little section kind of indicates already they came there, they traveled through the world, even though there were, were very few of them. They existed, potentially people talked about them over a long time. And they got also different names in all kinds of regions by the people. And I guess in a time back then, when a wizard appears, who men called wizards, the study, um, if if those appear, then I assume they kind of stick in the memory of people, maybe become even kind of legends, especially when they are always around for such a long time. We know that Gandalf often traveled to his, let's call them allies, to the Shire, often often, um, held council with Elrond and so on and so forth. So for sure he um, crossed some people. So I guess people kind of know. And then as another important thing, an interesting part of your question, you ask if men could learn sorcery. And indeed there there are hints in in the books um, of sorcerers. In, in the game. In a way, you could say the um, Nazgul are an interesting example here. Like the Witch King is also known as a sorcerer, kind of. And you could argue that is due to Sauron's power or due to the ring that he's wearing, for sure. But it seems in the world there is a word for sorcerer and in the same section in the Silmarillion, we can also read, um, In a dark hill he made his dwelling, and wrought there his sorcery. And all folk feared the sorcerer of Dol Guldur, and yet they knew not at first how great was their peril. 
At the beginning, they didn't know that Sauron was in Dol Guldur, and they expected a sorcerer. And it's very interesting that this is a differentiation that's different, for example, to in German, that um, we have the word wizard and sorcerer. And Tolkien very deliberately uses different terms for the evil side, where the sorcerers are, and the good side, where the wizards are. And e-study means something like those who know. And in wizards, as with wisdom, this kind of connects um, on a linguistic level as well. So from this perspective, um, it's a very deliberate choice to call the e-study wizards. Yeah, the wizards are the wise. And the e-study are those who know. And those who know can be wise. I guess not always, but you definitely um, see this. Also, Snow Warning is here. Nice to see you. Eshmul Schreiber is also here. Nice to see you as well. So that is um, definitely an interesting uh, detail for this. There's another, in, in a letter also about the um, wizards, let me just see if I find the letter really quick. Yeah, it is in letter 211 to Rona Bear. I'm not sure how the name is pronounced, to be fair. But English, <laughs> English last names, very difficult for me um, to often figure out how they are pronounced. Um, whatever, it doesn't matter too much. It's letter 211 in the Letters of Tolkien. And there's a question that also mentions that the, the section from Lord of the Rings, where it said there are, is a mention of five wizards, but we only know three. Who are the other two? And then Tolkien, this is one of the earlier, is this the early source? No, I think it's not. This is um, one of the earlier sources for the blue wizards. And he says, um, I have not named the colors because I do not know them. Well, technically, um, t there's also a footnote. Very interesting. Maybe we should check the footnote really quick because I'm curious what could be in this. I just have to find number three, footnote 211.3. Elsewhere, Tolkien called the other two wizards um, Ithrin Luin, the blue wizard. See Unfinished Tales, page 389. The, the, the letters from 1958 that I am um, was just in the middle of reading, that is... Um, very important detail and the text the East study is from 1954 roundabout in the unfinished tale so the unfinished tales text is actually older than what Tolkien wrote here I find it interesting that Tolkien actually wrote wrote an essay at this time he answered this letter already and says in the sentence because I do not know them he either he did not want to reveal it or and that's also a possibility because Tolkien iterated them quite a bit he was not sure yet what to do with those wizards, so he doesn't want to um, put too much um, into it. Because I do not know them. I, uh, let, let's start from the beginning. I have not named the colors because I do not know them. She asked um, what colors the other wizards have. I doubt if they had distinctive colors. Distinction was only required in the case of the three who remained in a relatively small area of the northwest. Uh, on the names, see... Question 5. I really do not know anything clearly about the other two, since they do not concern the history of the Northwest. I think they went as emissaries to distant regions east and south, far out of Numenorean range, missionaries to enemy-occupied lands, as it were. What success they had, I do not know, but I fear that they failed, as Saruman did, though doubtless in different ways. And I suspect they were... Now comes part of the question about sorcery, and I suspect they were founders or beginners of secret cults and magic traditions that outlasted the fall of Sauron. So in this very interesting answer, um, Tolkien actually suggests that they failed and maybe they founded magic cults. Since there weren't that many Maya, so these angel-like entities in Middle-earth, so the wizards were Mayas, basically angels of lower rank, let's say Mayas, Mayar, um, angels of lower rank, they potentially could have taught actual men 
to some magic tricks basically. And I assume that is definitely a possibility. So the idea that there were other sorcerers in the world, magic cults, traditions, something like that, definitely was on Tolkien's mind at that time at least. This was of course changed much later. And I'm also curious, question five. Not even sure if there is a mention about the names here in question five. It would be probably too much to just scan through it. So this is an early text. Then we have the e-study essay that we find at the very end, second last essay or sect, uh, per, um, chapter of um, Unfinished Tales. I think that's an interesting, as um, the Otaku Senpai mentioned. Yeah, the Mouse of Sauron is another example for and um, was a living man and also a black Numenorean sorcerer. Yeah, it's also a good, really good example, a very prominent as well. Just have to look at chat at times, it's pretty difficult to read and search for text. Dunedain hobbits and uh, oh, Druidain hobbits and Dunedain all have skills we would consider magical, but largely of another kind than what the wizards could do. It's also a good um, point by Snow Warning that magic is always kind of depending on your knowledge, on your view and standpoint, if that makes sense. Galadriel also mentions, for example, it's a good example as well, that the term magic is kind of strange for her. You find it confusing. There's also a weird mention of a distinction between different kinds of magic in, in a specific context. But it goes too far. Does somebody know the East study sect uh, quote? Because I don't remember how it's phrased. So I would have to read through only half the thing here. Well, how could it be? I think it was um, Otaku Senpai who suggested um, that, in, that in the East study essay there was also a hint like that. Maybe you have posted there. Yeah, it suggests that many wizards under the chiefmanship of the five you abandoned the view. Do you exactly um, know in which section it was, um, Otaku Senpai? Maybe it's at the beginning here. Ancient words, knowing some of that Easter is in Quenya, it's not mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with it. Magician later legend, they belonged solely to the third age and then departed a non-safe Elrond killer and got discovered what kind they were. But when were they both at first? From the Easter study um, of that order, the num yeah, now I rem this is a sentence I was also not remembering fully. I, yeah, it was, the nu what number was in it, right? It's relatively at the beginning here it is. Of this order, the number is unknown, but for those that came to the north of Middle Earth, where, where there was mo most hope because of the remnant of the Dunedain and of the Eldar that abode there, the chiefs were five. This is a very strange wording of this particular text. Yeah, it's just, I found it. Thank you, much appreciated. Uh, the first to come was uh, one of the noble uh, men and gr uh, great wait, men and uh, bearing with raven hair and fair voice, and he was clad in white. Great skill he had and works of hand, and he was regarded by well nigh all, even by the Eldar, as the head of the order. The others were also two clad in sea blue and one in 
earthen brown, and the last came one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and in looks more aged, grey head and grey clad, and leaning on a staff, but Kirdan from their first meeting at the Grey Havens divined in him the greatest spirit and the wisest, and he welcomed him with the reverence, and he gave his keeping uh, to his keeping the third ring Narya the Red. Then he says the famous words of, of, of rekindling the hearts and so on. We also see in Lord of the Rings. This essay here is from, um, yeah. The fullest account of the East study was written, as it appears, in 1954. See the introduction, page 12. I give it here in full and will refer to it subsequently as the essay or the East study. Uh, on the, the essay on the East study. That's a good argument by the snow, snow warning again. Um, the East study only had distant memories of the West, so they might not be 100% sure if they were the only ones. But yeah. Let me just try something really quick. But um, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting f sentence here of this order. The number is unknown, but of those that came to the north of Middle-earth, where there was most hope because of the remnants of the Dúnedain and the Eldar that abode there, the chiefs were five. It's a, it's a really strange, in my opinion, um, way to phrase it. It is often seen as an indicator that there might have been more. If if there were men among those with it, though, it's not clear because the whole essay, I think, outside of this sentence, never really um, indicates anything like this. It's more about that the uh, the East study that they they were sent, they appeared there, they they came to the north of Middle Earth from somewhere because there was most hope, and at least in the north of Middle Earth or in the northwest of Middle Earth. There were only these five. It says, and the chiefs were five. So the, the leaders were five. This this leaders means that there could be East study that were not leaders. It's really hard to tell what Tolkien had in mind here when he phrased this. But it's 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 very important to note here. I read you also like the um, Silmarillion section that ignores the existence of the blue of the blue withers, and if you don't know that there are two more withers, let me just uh, read the section here again. If I find it fast enough, yeah, Kurun, uh, chief among them. Uh, were those whom the elves called Mithrandi and Kurunir, but men in the north named Gandalf and Saruman. Of these, Kurunir was the eldest and came first, and after him came Mithrandir and Raragast. And the others of the East study, who went into the east of Middle-earth, and do not come in these tales. Oh, and others of the East study. I just read it wrong. So if you don't know that there are two more, you could definitely, in, if you take this text and the other, it could say, yeah, there, there are even others, but they maybe went elsewhere, and so we don't know. I would so say that, at least in the Northwest, there were only the three Istari we know. I think there's no indication in Lord of the Rings, in the stories, or in other texts. And on top of that, um, we have another source for the wizards, that is, of course, Peoples of Middle-earth.
and there's a text called the five uh, wizards. This is a very late text. The other text, uh, the, the East Study essay is from 1954. The letter I read is from 1958, so it's even later than this. It seems like Tolkien in his mind iterated all of this. And also in the, the East Study essay, I think there's also a second version of it. We have to look into this in a moment. Because here in this text, the text then continues with a passage given in Unfinished Tales, page 394, beginning. We must assume that they were all Mayar. But after the words which, uh, with which that citation ends, chosen by the Valar with this in mind, there stands only Saruman, the most powerful, and then it breaks off unfinished. Beside these last words is a penciled note. Radagast, name of Menish, Anduin Vale, origin, but not now clearly interpretable. See Unfinished Tales, page 390, note 4. And now, come, now comes something interesting. On the reverse of the page are some notes which I described in Unfinished Tales as uninterpretable, but which... But which with longer scrutiny, I have been largely able to make out. One of them reads as follows. And now comes this weird text. No names are recorded for those two wizards. They were never seen or known in lands west of Mordor. The wizards did not come at the same time. Possibly Saruman, Gandalf, Radagast did, but more likely Saruman, the chief, and already over mindful of this, came first and alone. Probably Gandalf and Radagast came together, though this has not yet been said. What is most probable, Glorfindel also met Gandalf at the Havens. The other two are only known to have existed, it now becomes difficult to read it seems, by Saruman, Gandalf and Radagast. The other two are only known to have existed by Saruman, Gandalf and Radagast. And Saruman, in his wrath mentioned five, was letting out a piece of private information. That's the text from the Lord of the Rings. The reference of the last sentence is so is to Saruman's violent retort to Gandalf at the door of Orthanc, in which he spoke of the rods of the five wizards. Another note is even rougher and more difficult. The other two came much earlier, at the same time probably as Glorfindel. Glorfindel came in version, a text later here, comes a bit after this text, we learn that Lord Findel came to Middle-earth in the second age already. Maybe 1200, 1600, somewhere, somewhere in between. When matters became very dangerous in the second age, Lord Findel was sent to aid Elrond and was, though not yet said, preeminent in the war of Eriador. But the other two Istari were sent for a different purpose. Mori Nechtar and Romestamo, Darkness Slayer and East Helper. The name East Helper already suggests they went to the East. They were sent elsewhere and had a different purpose than Glorfindel, for example. Their task was to circumvent Sauron, to bring help to the few tribes of men that had rebelled from Melkor worship, to steer up rebellion, something's missing, and after his first fall to search out a uh, his hiding in which they failed and to cause question mark dissension and disarray among the dark east they must have had very great influence on the history of the second age and third age in weakening and disarraying the forces of the east who would both in the second age and third age otherwise have outnumbered the west At the words of the citation from this text and unfinished tales of the other two, nothing is said in a published work save the reference of the five wizards in the alteration between Gandalf and Saruman. My father wrote, a note made on their names and functions seems now lost, but except for the names, their general history and effect on the history of the Third Age is clear. Conceivably, he was thinking of a sketched out narrative of the choosing of the East study at the Council of the Valar, Unfinished Tales, page 393, in which the two wizards, or blue wizards, Ithrin uh, Luin, were named Alatar and Palando. And this is the whole um, information we have. What is interesting here is 
that also in this text there's no really mention of they were the chiefs of x amount of number of other e study or something it's, it's no mention it even says as i read at the beginning that only very few people like lord findel knew about it gandalf knew about it radagast knew about it um saruman knew about it and that's basically um it so it makes very little sense i think from the perspective of lord of rings that there could be m much more in the northwest where the story plays what is in the east and other regions if there also were some unknown east study that also came with them is very unlikely what we um, just know is that we have three plus two secret east study we have a, a reference to and i think that is it you could maybe consider that glorfindel is also kind of an east study in in his own way but I mean, he comes not as a as a wizard. He comes as an elf of immense power, of course, but still um, also as a powerful um, entity from Valinor to aid Elrond and the elves. So he also has kind of a different purpose, of course, but you could argue his function is kind of similar. I'm going to stream in a few minutes for another um, premiere. I'll catch up um, on the rest of the stream later. Okay, thank you for also um, helping out here, um, Otaku Senpai. Sorry for not looking at chat for a moment. There's another reference in The Hobbit to Gandalf attending the Great Council um, of White Wizards. The White Council. Yeah, that is of course true. Well, there's no warning it says um, wizards are Maya sent to Middle Earth in the bodies of old men. Exactly. That is the only explanation uh, we have. Oh, be wait, that's also an interesting question. Can you po you can really post it on Discord if you want? Uh, post it in the Tolkien Media Channel or something, if you uh, have access to my Discord. The Mason Mark Discord, let's see if the bot is working. Not sure if it was just in the movie, but Saruman uh, positioned basically the necromancer as human, although it was actually a Sauron. It seemed um, accepted and creditable. Also, there was um, the Witch King. Are these um, wizards? I would say they're more sorcerers, like I said at the beginning. Also, welcome, Susha. Nice to see you here. Um, is uh, you know what I mean? Um, at, at the beginning, they like the the the, the Nazgul also men in the beginning, and you can see them kind of, especially the Witch King, as as kind of a sorcerer at the beginning in the stream we said that um, Tolkien dis really differentiates between wizards which includes basically the same root as the word wise and e study means those who know so these are kind of connected and the others who are playing maybe with let's call it dark magic with sorcery which is like um, a distinction Tolkien definitely makes in his text at least it's implied um, is, is, is something different it's not the the wizards are the wise the forces of good the um the, the sorceress kind of not i think in morgos ring we have like an interesting reference to the to the difference here in case people are interested in that let me just see if i find my morgos wing book really quick Let me see if I find it really quick. It's somewhere in this bracket. <laughs> Old, not needed. Hmm. 
Now there it is. It was this Morgos element in matter indeed, which was a prerequisite for such magic and other evils as Sauron practiced with it and upon it. So he calls it um, He's basically talking about, about the power of Sauron and the potential also hinting at the powers that others might use. And it is always a requirement to use this that Morgoth put his power inside the world, not the oceans though, and so on and the itself. And this has to be used to, 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 to even, to, 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 yeah, what do you call it? To, to cast this magic. I don't have a better word for it to use this magic or to make it to be. And he, here he means definitely um, the sorcery. The Quenya word uh, nole meant law knowledge, but it's Sindarin equivalent a ghoul owing a uh, uh, to its frequent use in such combinations as Morgul, Minas Morgul, the Lord of the Rings, was only used for evil and perverted knowledge, necromancy, sorcery. This word ghoul was also used in the language of Mordor. We can also find like, some, some interesting um, details can be uncovered here with this. Oh, Adam Williams, welcome. Nice to see you. Is there any interesting etymology to um, Palant here? I think um, the Palant here, if I remember, let me just look up the root of the word. There's, for example, um, the one of the two blue with it is in in the old in the old version. He's called not um, he's called Palando, Palando and Alatar, and um, I think Palando means something also uh, something like far-sighted, if I remember correctly. And basically, the the root is pal in it means means basically far, and um, same with with the word palantir, which the Quenya word also meaning, I assume, Farsia far or Farsighted, something like this. Let me just look the elf, the Elvish dictionary really quick. Let me see if I find the etymology here. Palando, mm -hmm -hmm. words pal, far, uh, palan, far, uh, far wide, uh, far distant, to great extent, and NDO is like the. Uh, he is described as masculine agent to it. So it's derived from, from this word far. Not necessarily means um, far seer. And the, the, na the, the new names they got in the later version, um, Mori Nechtar, um, which is a darkness slayer, and um, the other one, Romestamo, East Helper. It seems like the there is definitely something also in his in the name Palando, including far. It's potentially not far seer, but something like I don't know maybe he traveled far. Um, something like this could uh, could be. Um, meant by, by by this word. It's kind of interesting that um, the palantir also has the same word for far in it. Uh, in in uh, Sindarin. So there's that. But there it means far seer. Often also used as seeing stone, but I think the word does not include the the word stone. It's more like far gazer, far seer, something like this. Far ranging. That's potentially um, a good good way to translate it. Yeah. No, sorry. And also welcome. Oh, 
Also, Gaurav um, Tripathi, thank you, much appreciated for your kind words. That you uh, enjoy the content here on the channel, much, much appreciated. Now I have to really scroll up here. Oh, Gilgaya is also a welcome. Yeah, there are also, um, in Nature of Middle-Earth, um, Otaku Senpai mentioned, there, there is a mention of the guardians, of the five guardians that protected the elves during the Great Journey. And uh, in this text, we also find uh, a new name for the... If, it, it's not clear if they really are the Blue Wizards, but it's the most likely assumption, I would call it. And they're... Um, that they called Hymenar, and the other one I always forgot. And that's how you write Hymenar. Um, Palakendo, that's the other name. In this name also, um, Pala we have the, the P-A-L in it, so also potentially meaning something that has to do with Fa. But then we also find like, um, for example, Ravandil for the na name for Radagast, I think we have not heard anywhere else. Tarindor, later Saruman, and Olorin. Olorin, of course, we know is Gandalf's name. It's kind of interesting, this um, This is a really weird text, <laughs> to be honest. It's also relatively late. I think the text here is from 1959. So Tolkien, it seems like Tolkien in the background really iterated through names for the Blue Wizards quite a bit. It's kind of uh, fasc fascinating in this context. But yeah, to coming back to the original question that you see on the screen, how do the people know? I think it's just, it can only be explained by, by legend. It is difficult to say, like, if, if we go back into the idea and meaning of the word wizard, it is somebody who is wise. It's a wise man or woman, if that makes sense. So they can be seen as wizards, even though they're, the term is not necessarily often used in the context of Tolkien terminology here and there. So as a result, I would definitely argue um, that even though that is not the case, inside the world, others could be also called wizards. For example, we know Andres was a wise woman of the Edain, of the house of, of the later called house of, well, it was during this time, there was still the house of Beor. I, th I hope I don't talk nonsense and she's from the other house, but... Yeah, she's from the house of Beor. Just want to make sure. Um, she's a wise woman. You could also say she's maybe also a wizard. She's wise, she has the knowledge, she knows the past, she knows the law. And now if she would also be able to have like an ability that others can't really explain, then we also get this magical component. But I think like the wizards often did also amazing things. But, um, and when we look into Lord of the Rings, it's an interesting idea. Like I, I just said, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be a magical thing. However, the idea that sorcerers can, uh, wizards can magic, we see let me just see if I find the... the into a frog. But um, Barleyman um, Butterbur, for example, fears that Gandalf might turn him into something. Or Gandalf threatens him in a way. I promise I don't find the quotes uh, fast because I forgot how it was phrased. Does somebody remember um, 
this thing, I think, I hope I don't mix it up with, with the films. But I think Butterbur kind of fears um, that Gandalf might do something to him. Which Gandalf never would do, but the idea that this is possible must be there. You're the master. Mm -hmm. I'm mortal afraid of what Gandalf will say if harm comes of it. It is not the section I mean. It's kind of difficult to just scan through the whole book finding this particular small quote snippet. We just, it's sometimes so difficult if you don't remember how something is phrased exactly, then you just have to look for a long time. I don't find it, Chad. Okay, this is later in the book. Come at least the brie. I want to see Butterbur in the evening. Want to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. That's at the very end. It's from the Council of Elrond. Gandalf explains what happened. Yeah, okay, that's that makes sense. Let me just see if I find it really quick. Because that's an it's an interesting um case. But a burr, they call him, if it's the lay is his fault. I will melt all the butter in him. I will roast the old fool over a slow fire. He expected no less, and when we saw my face, I think... I, I don't exactly find, but there's, there's a hint of that he, he definitely fears that um, Gandalf uses, like, kind of magic on him or something. I think it's not... I simply can't remember how it was phrased. Maybe it was also just in the films, I don't know. I don't bite a bark very a, a little. Yeah, something something like this. I'm, I, I feel like there was some other thing or so. Like there's there's this thing. Um, I will roast the old fool of so fire. He expected no less. I will um, I will melt all the butter in him. Something like this. I think there's another reference to to kind of this um, meeting with Gandalf or so. It might also be earlier. Yeah, yeah. My, my the idea was more that it is more magical in nature. I, th I remember that something like this was mentioned in, uh, discussed in one of the um, film and book differences videos, but it's a few years ago that I made that video, so I can't fully remember 
what I said there. So just looking into it is a bit difficult, but the I, I think the idea is kind of present that Gandalf can do magic tricks. So it's not necessarily like that. So if somebody can do something like this, like some form of magic or something that others don't understand, it could also be healing or something where people say, okay, that's a miracle, that's, that's supernatural in a way that he can um, heal people like that. And he's a wizard, he's wise, and so on. Exactly, there's also the, the other case where there's a blessing that Gandalf put on Butterbur's beer. Yeah. Love Bali, man, I said. It's the best news I have had since midnight. It's uh, worth a gold piece at least. May your beer be laid under an enchantment of surpassing excellence for seven years, I said. Now I can take a night's rest, the first since I have gotten one. That we also find in this particular section. So there is some natural... Um, there's, there's definitely a hint of like he ex explicitly also used the word enchantment. That's kind of um, interesting. Yeah, and also Butterbur confirms that the blessing made to be a better in book six. <laughs> it's also pretty cool. That's also what I love about Tolkien. Like you could easily forget about a detail you wrote early in the book, like this, like a small. It's just a sentence, and later <laughs> it kind of comes true. It's kind of cool. But yeah, the point is, I think that the term wizard could have been used. We always had like um, potential sorcery in the world in some form. If the sorcery is done and used in a wise way, then you have a wizard. If not, then you have a sorcerer, kind of. That's at least how I would um, interpret this. And since this was especially true for these Mayar coming to Middle-earth to help against or to, to, to help starting a rebellion against Sauron and prepare the northwest of Middle-earth against Sauron and to defeat him in the end. In, the, in this context, I would argue that this was very fitting for these Maiar, for these uh, wizards. So that's why they were called like that. And of course, they were the East study, those who know. So it was kind of that term. It was also fitting translation for the term East study in of itself. But uh, it, it's an interesting question, though, that, um, that the, the wizards, in theory, are not common, but they could be more common. It's just outside of our story and just a term for a specific kind of people. Like I said, we had Andres as wise woman. We have Melbes, for example, also like a wise man who could even see into the future. I could, I could definitely see that in the region where Malbeth lived, um, we also had um, people thinking that he was a wizard or something. So they potentially call him the seer or something like this, but. Yeah. Yeah, everyone seems to know Gandalf himself all across Middle Earth. That is also a thing. Gandalf was a person who was very close to the people in Middle Earth and he traveled among men a lot, but also among elves. That's like um, Thranduil definitely knew Gandalf. Of course, he, we also know Kir, uh, Elrond and also Círdan um, um, had dealings with Gandalf as well. So he was like a pretty big all-rounder. Also the dwarves knew him. We can read um, that Gandalf um, yeah, had a billion names in the world because he went to so many places. And, the, and you just need a name for somebody if he has kind of an impact. Like um, his original name, Olorin, the elves called him Ithrandir. The people in the south called him Incanos. Um, the, the dwarves called him um, Tharkun. Then the, the people of Rohan had like, I don't know, Greyhame um, and, and Stormcrow. Then the old English name, uh, Lath, um, <laughs> how to say, Lath, 
last spell was really, th to s really difficult <laughs> though that is the name grima worm tongue gave him which means ill news and yeah just quite a quite a few names in different regions gandalf of course is also one of the names he um, got even though that's a reference to uh, the, the poetic edda <laughs> kind of probably met more people than anyone in the history of Arda. That might be actually true. Oh, nice. Chetty Lumpkin is also here. Hey, no, no worries about simple questions. I like simple questions because they are hopefully also... Sometimes they are not simple to answer, though. But they have the potential to be simple to answer. Even though I also like complicated questions. Can we call anyone doing something exceptionally well a wizard in Tolkien's world? Yeah, maybe something like this. <laughs> I'm a wizard of the X. I mean, like I said, for, for being called a wizard, or I guess it could also change, but at least from the etymo uh, etymology standpoint, it has to be... Um, somebody who is wise as well. So it's, it's an interesting question if, um, if Gimli can be considered wise or not. No, you posted the map on Discord. Thank you much. Appreciate it. All the time ago. Oh, I've talked about, I, I'm not sure if uh, <laughs> maybe um, Nolarin already fell asleep <laughs> and um, Say, yeah, this didn't really answer my question, but I think, yes, it is possible that humans could be considered wizards. I think it is maybe very difficult for humans to be considered Istari because the Istari seem to me kind of an established group that also seems to be immortal. So they are around for a very long time. That definitely is a thing. But I think in theory, yes, it might be possible. And of course, we know about the, let's say, not forces of the good focused people who do magic which are sorcerers and also we know about humans that can be sorcerers. so the answer is kind of yes it was a long answer though yeah exactly it's not a competition it's just uh, sharing knowledge and discuss uh, discuss talking law and stuff it's always great when people come together and talk about one of their favorite books and stuff. I have to look here on my uh, Discord. Oh, that's the um, the original map stuff. And we have almost to discuss this next. Unfortunately, I don't have too much to say about this. I really need, would need to look um, into this a little bit. I was looking currently at the at the map that was posted. Very interesting. of the causes. Oh, here's the Ezelon thing. <laughs> K 
Okay, that's elephants. Just looking at the map currently it kind of distracts me a little bit. So the question was, um, um, let me just read it from Discord. The question was um, on Pauline Baines, I think that's how it's pronounced, a uh, map annotated by Tolkien, there are two interesting entries, Fear, F-I-R, and Black Swan. Any thoughts on that? Out of the, just out of the blue, not yet, but we might, we could look into it. I have the problem that I can't um, show the map. I, I, of course, could, technically I could do this, but since I don't have the rights for the map, um, it's always uh, difficult. So I just show you the other map and just show you where it is in comparison on the map. It's an interesting question, I think. So it seems there is, for example, an area called um, uh, Black Swan. Swan. However, wait, let me consult the Cambridge Dictionary very shortly. It's Swan. Okay, it's an o, it's an o sound. Um, Black Swan. Um, that is on the map. Let me just get my map. Thing here. Now let's say round about here on the map. Here on the map you don't see the entry, but there's a map with annotations um, made, and these annotations um, include the word black swan, which is on the original map uh, photograph of the map very difficult to read. There's FIR. What FIR could mean, I have no clue, like very little. Black Swan is, is an interesting one because Tolkien often has um, places that um, include the word Swan here and there. For example, there is a place on the map called Swan Fleet. Oh, I moved my map instead of the arrow. Mistakes were made, Chad. And that is, yeah, I would say it's, in my imagination, it's somewhere here. Round about where um, Ostinesil is. And there are some descriptions, I think, in some books that describe, uh, that call this place as one fleet which is an interesting which is an interesting name so in theory there's a light black brown the undeeps the brown lands swan fleet have a bracken I assume it's just like some local name for this particular place that uh, that, that that existed. Maybe there is like I don't know some area where, for example, black swans are kind of common. Maybe it's also some kind of I don't know uh, bird legs. I'm I'm not sure how common. Uh, Aragorn talks about black swans, I think. That's that's an interesting yeah, that's an interesting idea actually. We could look if we find a reference to that in the books. I mean that's potentially black swans. Um Chapter nine, the Great River. There was no sign of uh living moving things save birds. Of these there were many, small fowl whistling and piping in the weeds, but they were seldom seen. Once or twice the travelers heard the rush of, of wine of swan wings, and looking up they saw a great phalanx streaming along the sky. Swan, said Sam, 
and mighty big ones too. Yes, said Aragorn, and they are black swans. How white and empty and mournful all this country looks, said Frodo. I always imagined that uh, as one journeyed south, it, it got warmer and merrier until winter was left behind forever. And so on and so forth. This is the second last chapter of um, of um, Fellowship of the Ring, by the way. So also very good catch by um, B824. There's um, definitely a mention. So I assume maybe this is a place where the Black Swans were um, flying to, to, I don't know, maybe on, on their way south, let's say, or to other places. Um, they rested there. I could imagine that is maybe the idea. Or in this, I'm not sure when this when, when this draft was actually made, but I assume it was later made. So in this regard, um, I'm not 100 sure um, how this could 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 work out. Maybe he had an idea that they would find these ones later. Very uh, difficult to say. It could also be that um, this is kind of relatively close to where the um, fellowship actually saw the, um, the this one. So that's wrong. Where's my OB? Uh, where's my map? Here it is. So it's a bit hard to tell where they already are when they uh, look into this land. Maybe they are. They must be here on the way down. This chapter here, if we look at the um, chapter list, is, um, what did I say, uh, Journey of the Dark. Los Lorien, Mirror of Galadriel, Farewell to Lorien, the Great River. And in this chapter, the Great River, where they follow the Anduin, um, it is. And then we have the Breaking of the Fellowship which then um, goes down into this direction. And in book two, the two towers, we have the departure of Boromir, which is in the film still part of the Fellowship of the Ring, for my opinion, good reasons. So, um, and as mentioned, the Black Swans are mentioned here. So maybe they looked into the distance or something and they saw the, the, the Black Swans flying into this direction or so. So I could imagine this might be the actual reference um, for the Black Swans, if that makes sense. Yeah, that is the also... Um, Gregory um, also posted the right quote. That was a quote I was th kind of thinking of. We talked about when we talked about Gandalf and wizards, um, you know, doing magic, potential magic tricks. Ah, that was Gandalf. If you know who I mean, a wizard. They say he is, but he's a good friend of mine, whether or no. But now I don't know what he will have to say to me. If I see him again, turn all my ale sour or me into a block of wood. So here we have the mention that he is turned into a block of wood. I forgot that it was a block of wood. But yeah, this is exactly. Um, I shouldn't wonder. He's a bit hasty. Still, what's done can't be undone. So um, yeah, this is the this is a section I meant. So it seems like Butterbur definitely has the assumption that he can turn his ale sour or bless it and also can turn him into a block of wood. If Gandalf actually can do this, I don't know. But um, yeah. Swans like marshes. Exactly. That's also a good point, I think. I have to admit my biologic knowledge and knowledge of animals and their um, habitats is relatively, um, let's say, small. But, 
yeah, it, 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 it kind of makes sense. So I assume they either rest there, they can be found there, maybe the Fellowship also saw them flying into this direction and that is why Tolkien put it on, or why well, this was annotated to the map. Very interesting um, detail. The other thing, the FIR, fear, is here. Kind of. In this section. I have to admit, I don't have a good idea for that. It is blue. It has a circle around it. Same as this one thing. So it's maybe a time related thing. Hmm. Let me just look something up really quick. Fate. Fear can mean fate. It can also mean die. Die or fate, if it's an elvish word. Does somebody have a good idea for the fear? Fear is a word root associated with um, death in Quenya and Sindarin. Yeah. It could also be English, like a tree, right? Fear could be in German, it would be Tanne. Let me just look it up, because I'm not too familiar with planned words. Pronounced fur, it seems. <laughs> I just learned that. Wood from a fire tree. A tall evergreen tree. It grows in cold countries and has uh, and has leaves that are like needles. <laughs> That's a description here of the word. So maybe it is this that it just says this is more. So I guess because Tolkien likes likes to describe landscape and so on. Tis of Mordor, Fear, Kerin Amros. He sometimes mentions in the blue stuff here a tower. Here's Los Lorien. Maybe that's a distance thing here that's also in blue. Like I said, you have to look on the Discord to see the map. Black Swan. So yeah, I could imagine that this simply is a region where a lot a lot of firs are if I pronounce this correctly, I'm standing that this is more like a needle tree um, area of, of this. We would have to maybe look into the books if there's a switch between the trees, like trees with classic leaves versus needles. Something happens on that journey along the Anduin. Very hard to tell. We also have the Firian wood and the Halifirian along the path the Roerim took to Minas Tirith. That's actually a good point. Could also be related to this, right? Firian? Let me just look the eto etymology of that. Firian hold means mountain wood.
Aliferian, for example, means holy mountains in Rohanese. So it's derived from Old English. Source is um, for this the Reader's Companion, page 770. Heilig is the German word for um, holy. I think holy itself is also related. Let's just look really quick into this. I assume it's um, Heilig, Heilach. Should be English, holy should be the same etymology, right? Old English, Heilig, Heilach. I assume you can leave this. Let me see, Old English. Do we find this here? Only we find Middle English. I assume there might be a thing in Old English as well. Hmm. I don't know the roots in Old English. That's not what I'm looking for. Scottish, but they're definitely some etymologies. Old Irish, I don't find the old English root for it. Darling and Balin had um, swarmed up tall slender fir with few branches and were trying to find a place to sit on the greenery at topmost point. Yes, I think that seems to be the, the most likely, right? Of difficult to make this here on the fly. It can mean wood. And then my old English knowledge is sadly not um, good enough. The old English word for mountain would usually be, um, in German we have the word berg, so it would be um, berg. In old English, it seems to be Alaferian also kind of, um, Halifirian also seems to have some some reference to that. Maybe I'm, I need to look maybe into the companion. Maybe the companion gives us a more clear etymology. Wait a moment. Oh, welcome back. I'm seeing with my fear uh, is necromancer in Old English. The others are boring. It is true. 
if you translate Sindarin, it would include fear. That's that's an interesting idea as well. Let us see, seven hundred seventy. Virian, Rohan representing an old word, old English. Ah, here it is. Virian, Virian. Ah, I I know my. You know what my 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 mistake is. Uh, also, Mary um Co uh, Cohonen. I think you missed a dot in your text somewhere, even though I don't see it. Yeah. Then the bot thinks you posted a link, which you didn't do. Don't worry about it. Um, I can still see your message, though. Sorry for the bot timing you out. It's always when you... It's very dangerous to, to leave out a dot here. So, you know what the problem is? I did not thought about this. The G is a very strange um, um, consonant in Old English. It has their different depending on position and what is before and comes after it and so on. Um, it, it can change quite a bit. How, how do you pronounce it? It can sometimes be a G. Oh, Tiaza is here. Welcome. Nice to see you. Um, the yeah, It can pronounce as a G. I guess it's very rare in Old English though that you pronounce it as a hard G. I think it can happen though. I don't know an example though. Usually you pronounce this as a, as a Y sound, so Y. In this case, it is it is spelled fear uh, f i r g e e n the word I'm looking for. However, the G is pronounced in this case as a Y sound, so fearien instead of feargen or something like this. And this seems to be an old word for mountain, so an old English old word, and that is why I didn't find it here in my dictionary because I simply don't know the root. Old English, it is a form that is actually very interesting. It means mountain or mountain forest. Bayarguni would be the Gothic cognate for it. That's interesting. I'm not sure if there are other words related to this. Also, the EPA here in the article is, I think, wrong. I think it's uh, it's not Fierchen. It's um, it can also be, it's, for example, uh, the word uh, Berg would be in Old English Burg. And it's a ch sound at the end. So the G can also be a ch, and it can also be like in the case of Smeagol, if you pronounce it old in English, it could be in Smeagol. So it can be also a voiced velar fricative. So they're different, de depending on certain circumstances, it's the pronunciation of the G is very different in old English. And it seems like here it would be a Y sound, and that is how Firien happened. Because it's actually Fiergen. It's it's very interesting that um, Tolkien spelled it with a Y sound because that's how it's pronounced. So it's more like a phonetic spelling Tolkien used here for the Old English word. That's very interesting. So today we learned um, Halafirien, uh, Halifirien, <laughs> Hali, holy. And uh, Fiergen, uh, Fierien, Fierien. So usually I would also say it's pronounced Halafirien, but then it would be actually Hala. Uh, no, it's it's right, Halafirien. Yeah, Fierien, Halafirien. Complicated. Old English is sometimes difficult. <laughs> But usually I go to the I and slide to the Y sound, so Firien. But it should be Firien, Halifirien. Uh, it should be the actual Old English pronunciation. I never knew this, to be fair. That's so it's a good point that you made there. 
also um, Bewhite's 24 found something else. Um, there lies um, the fastness of Southern Mirkwood, said Haldir. It is, it is clad in a forest of dark fir, where the trees strive one against another and the branches rot and wither. Lord, from Lord of the Rings. I did not expect that this question would um, kind of lead to, to so much language stuff, but it's kind of like, it's in the chapter um, Los Lorien. So yeah, it seems that is the explanation. Be White found a potential truth, or not truth, but proof, that the Southern Mirkwood, it is clad, though there lies the fastness of Southern Mirkwood, said Haldir, it is clad in a forest of dark fir, where the trees strive against one another and, uh, and their branches rot and wither because it gets closer to Dol Guldur. Even though I'm um, with um, snow warning there, that uh, the necromancer theory is more interesting, but it seems like the actual truth is potentially just it means there are furs there, and we just found um, yeah the hint at, at in the southern area there are, as Haldir describes it, more of these um, needle trees. So very interesting question, I have to say. I didn't know about this as well too much. Shout outs to Bewait24 because um, that helped greatly. Now time to look into the old English um, stuff from it. Also the hint with Halafirian and so on. All, uh, Halif, I always say Hala. Halif, Halifirian. That is so interesting. Also welcome, Mr. Man. Would the second music be better than the unmarred first music? And if so, did Eru knew from the beginning of Melkor would interfere and the second music was Eru's plan all along? As an omnis omniscient being, he must have had that sort of uh, awareness, right? Eru mentioned um, the discord to the music would be his instrument in the devising of things more wonderful. Nice name, Mr. Man. Yeah, very nice name. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Man. Oh, Matt also, well, Matt uh, Coles is also welcome. Shout out to you as well. Too many questions that are interesting here that I want to answer. Good to be back. Yeah, be awesome. Uh, you did not, exactly, Mary, you did not post the link, but the bot interpreted because you missed a space after a dot, it thought that, um, I don't know, links.end or something, or links.i is a link, and then it made it. The bot is a bit stupid, though. Sorry for the um, inconvenience, Mary. But let's not jump uh, back and forth too much. So the second music and the first music, I would say he kind of knew because I think the idea of Melkor all along was that he's kind of a dissonance to it. And in music, you always need dissonance to make it interesting, if that makes sense. So he allowed there to be dissonance, in my opinion. I think it's a bit more complicated this goes more into a theological um, realm, I think, of discussion when it comes to Melkor. Also, Kimberly80 um, drew a new artwork of Melkor, which I kind of um, like, so we can show it off here really quick. Of course, I make many mistakes here in my approach. Oh, I love that it never shows this year. Now oh, that is, I found it. 
it's a it's a pretty unusual style for Kimberly, I have to admit, but I kind of like it. Very talented artist. You see, yeah, the shot is the correct one. This also exists in a physical form, which I also find impressive. You could argue he looks a bit more like an elf, but um, I don't know. It's her interpretation of um, that. And I appreciate that a lot. So yeah, um, he... I think it's you could make the argument it's kind of his decision how much he want to interfere, how much he want to put um, dissonance into something. And if you, as said, if you talk about music and let's say music theory, there always have to be dissonance, uh, some sounds that are more dissonant than than the more not dissonant sounds. Like you need like dissonance needs in music one of the. <laughs> You can't generalize this, but a very basic um, fundament in music is that you have dissonance, like you have your harmony, then you have the dissonance to it, and then you resolve the dissonance back into harmony, if that makes sense. So in this regard, um, it is kind of uh, yeah important that it exists, I think, for a good story. And there's a there's a letter where Tolkien calls Eru the author of the story, and he says in this he um, Let me see if I find it. He says that he's the author of the story, I not me myself. Something like this is phrased. Let me see if I find this in the letters. In one of the letters, I know that for a fact. Yeah, the other power then took over. The writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself, he means Eru here. So he com he kind of metaphorically compares him of the writer of the story, Eru, in this scenario. If you it's in letter one hundred and ninety-two from nineteen hundred fifty-six to Amy Ronald. And um interestingly from the twenty seventh of July nineteen hundred fifty six, so almost um in, in ten days this letter has birthday <laughs> kind of. Um, it's it's very interesting in this regard that he compares it here he, Eru with a writer of the story and in a good story you always need also a conflict, also a dissonance and I think he only um, gets this by um, by adding this you know what I mean, like by, by adding dissonance and Melkor was this dissonance, I think that was his function, his purpose his power kind of to, to dissonate to to create to bring dissonance into the world, and I think the difference compared to the others is how much dissonance would Melkor bring into the world, or Morgos later bring into the world. That he would bring dissonance was clear, but the intensity of the dissonance was not clear. Or let's let's say it differently: it was the decision of Melkor, and. I think here we come back to a very interesting text from Nature of Middle-earth, the Osanwe Kenta, 
I often quote this, kind of. At the very end, Tolkien says something in this essay, something very interesting. I read this, I feel, last stream or so as well. It's kind of always fitting. And it talks about Manwe, the brother of Melkor, and about his promise to to Melkor that he would, after he, after his his punishment is over, he had to remain in the halls of Mandos for some time, so uh, Melkor, for three ages, whatever that means. That means the the the, the ages from the perspective of the um, Valian years, but let's not go into time calculation here. If Manwe had broken this promise for his own purposes, even though still intending good, he would have taken a step upon the path of Melkor. So what Tolkien kind of implies here is that also for the forces of good for Manwe, it is it is possible to take the step into the direction of Melkor. For Melkor, it was maybe easier to take the step. But I think he also had a decision to make how f how much dissonance he would bring into the world. And he, you could argue, brought a lot of dissonance. He decided to go for a very nihilistic approach to the point where he wanted to not only bring dissonance into the world, but basically be nihilistic and destroy the whole creation of Eru and the others. Because it it was not his creation. And this made him into the first Dark Lord. If that makes sense. So it is a very interesting question that Mr. Men um, uh, had here. I think though Eru kind of knew. The question is, if there is true free will, did Eru know how Melkor would decide? Or how much dissonance he would bring into the world? Probably not. Probably he knew. I'm not. I don't know. It's difficult to say. You could, for example, bring the argument: the the Valar have free will, but um, Eru knows anyway how they will decide. It's kind of a paradox when it comes to um, to to be all knowing. If that makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, it's cool to know this in detail, yeah. Yeah, that is true. It 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 not it does not have to be a contradiction if God knows everything and if the, his creation has free will. Like there are multiple ways you could solve this kind of Maybe you could even argue it's it's a definition thing. Let's say Eru knows every outcome that is possible. Then he's still all knowing. The question is if he knows which outcome is the correct one or is the, mo is the most likely one or even he knows all the outcomes that will take place then the decision is still possible but it, it comes then down to, to if it's predetermined or not like you can make a decision but it was known which, which decision path you took if that makes sense uh, in, in advance it's a complicated topic. Let's not go too deep into this. Yeah, that's also an interesting um, aspect you could bring that Eru is outside of time. He's even in a place called the Timeless Halls. And the world is inside time. So um, in, inside the time, it isn't determined what you decide, but outside of it, kind of is that's, that's basically all, almost coming down to to definition of and perspective if that makes sense
like if you have a, I would go. Did, maybe some people in chat saw the film Interstellar, which is my. I don't want to spoil Interstellar here, but it tries to visualize the concept of higher dimensionality, if that makes sense, at one point in this um, film. And I think they did a really good job about this. They basically tried to explain that from a certain perspective, you have the perspective of all possible outcomes of each possible timeline, depending on your position in which dimension you are. And from this perspective, your question what happens next is a completely different because you know all the possibilities at once. Or you can see them at once, if that makes sense. And then we can also go into physics and modern physics interpretations of, for example, that every decision path creates a parallel universe and stuff like this. But I would go to potentially too far. But it's a very good question. It's just insanely tough to answer. But that would be something like my answer. I hope um, Mr. Man, this was kind of a sufficient answer. <laughs> Thank you for the depth answer. Yeah, no problem, man. Chad has a lot of uh, good answers today. I also skipped about. Don't f um, hesitate to at times repost your question so we can discuss this. Okay, Mary um, Corona also um, added to the swan discussion we had a moment ago. Hello, the company sees the swans then uh, when they were near the north, northern border of Rohan. There's the space that's mis mis uh, missing. Aragorn um, spoke about uh, Limlight. So, yeah. And that um, adds to this again. Um, there is a, p a particular passage in Return of the King which I think sort of illustrates how the dissonance Melkor created gave an opportunity for there to exist something even more beautiful. And all the host laughed and wept, and their joy was like swords, and they passed in thought out to regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of uh, blessedness. Now, I think I know what you mean. Oh, interesting Hobbit question. But yeah, um, Joe has an interesting question. Joe posts um, something um, in Troll Williams' purse says to Bilbo, um, eh, who are you? <laughs> what, um, was that the purse talking or something else in there? Like, in a weird way, I think the Hobbit story is like very fairy tale oriented or inspired. So I think it is actually um, the purse that is... Um, talking there. It was Troll's purses are the mischief and this was no exception. Er, who are you? It squeaked. 
and it's written in the Hobbit. It's kind of interesting. As it left the pocket, so it's clearly that it must be the purse that um, is talking here, which is kind of funny. But yeah, my, my answer to this is like to Hobbit stuff like this is always it's a Hobbit. The Hobbit is, um, yeah, I said it's just fairy tale esque. Let me see if I find the, the troll. The best screenshot I could find in this. The purse is from Gondolin, of course. Oh, Mark Schiesa had a question at the very beginning. I read your question and I forgot about it again. Uh, why is it that only Legolas could see the Nazgul flying above the army of the West on its way north to the Black Gate? Are half elven uh, eyes lesser or were Eladan and Elru here? not present? That's a really good question, though. Um, I th like, in theory, Eladan and Elro here, the sons of Elrond, should have been present there. Or I'm missing something, maybe not. Let me just see, is there something after the... Well, they were with a great company. They fought Aragorn through the path of the dead, fought with him at uh, Pelargir, and took part in the battle of the Pelennor fields, where they fought with stars uh, bound to their bows. In theory, they should be there. Maybe somebody in chat has a good answer for that. <laughs> if Sam's rope can untie itself, then um, I guess a talking purse is okay. Also, always see, like I said, see the see the Hobbit always as a children's story, as a as a fairy tale. Maybe also Bilbo is an unreliable narrator and adds some things that makes it more funny or interesting for the children, something like that. I was kidding, but yeah, I, 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 I got it was a joke. It was a very far side. It's very possible the sons of Elrond couldn't see as far. It, definitely a possibility. Maybe among the far-seeing elves, uh, Legolas is a king. It's not definitely a possibility. It could also be, I mean... In theory, I'm not sure though, you could make the argument because um, Eladan and Elro here, same as Arwen, Arwen, was considered half-elven and they haven't decided yet. Maybe their vision would get more elven-like when they decide to be elves. Hard to tell though, if that is the actual reason. Tolkien never really elaborates if something has a physical change to somebody if he decides to become an elf. Or if something or it's, it's purely a life force thing like or the accept like it's, it's just about accepting the gift of men or if there are other benefits or um negative effects happening depending on if you are an elf or a man uh, when you decide to become elf or man as half elf i don't have a good answer for this um uh, mark unfortunately i would love to say yeah it's totally like that but out of my head, I can't come up with a good answer here why they couldn't. I, I like the answer that maybe Legolas had, had, was simply even better far-sighted, or that it had to do, as you said, or that self-suggested that that half-elven eyes might be not as good as true elven eyes, if that makes sense. 
yeah, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses after all. So that's why I also like your suggestion there quite a bit because it could be just an individual thing. Even the other Legolas from Gondolin had great eyesight, that is true. <laughs> at the same time, Eladan, Elro here and Arwen basically lived as elves, at least until Arwen made their choice. Yeah, that's kind of true as, as well. Yeah, they had definitely longer lifespan than men, but like I said, maybe I'm not sure if other physical adjustments are made when they make this final decision at the end and then their vision becomes also even better. Hard to tell. Maybe you could also... No, that would not be a good argument. Legolas is also very young. I would say he is as young as... Um, Eladan could even be older than Legolas, I think. Do you think Legolas is born in the second age? I don't think so. Actually, I think that is insanely unlikely. It could also be an oversight by Tolkien for sure. Yeah, that is always also a possibility. I mean, that's usually the, the, the best explanation. Tolkien simply overlooked this this little detail here. Also, we should change the, uh, the image here. Do I have an image of Eladan and Elro here? I only have one from um, from what is it called, Chat? From the video game from uh, War on the North. So somebody is very good at making fan art. I would love to have an Eladan and Elro here artwork. <laughs> I don't have one, I think. All I can give you is from the video game. War in the North. Unfortunately, it's hard to see which one is a better one. This is from War in the North. Eladan and Elro here appear there. How, the, how about the two just didn't look up? <laughs> also a possibility. Yeah, you can definitely make uh, multiple um, answers for that. I think there were some other questions, right? Okay, we talked about the second music. Ah, uh, Matt Coles had an interesting question. Tolkien intended for his work to be fictional history of the real world. Are there clues in his writings that suggest this? 
I would say uh, he depends on how you define his writings. If you include also his unpublished um, elements or his later published, but after his death published um, writings, then for sure. It maybe put also like a question back on screen, which I forgot for the last few things. I had the best question and I now can't remember it. Yeah, it's, it's, I, it's always terrible if you forget what you just... Uh, I know this feeling. And um, so, yeah, the, the, there is a hint for this because Tolkien wrote um, about a character called um, Elf Winne. Also, the elves called him Eriol. And Elf Winne, um, it was basically kind of the end of, or not the end, but yeah, kind of part of the Silmarillion. I'm actually 5% sure that Elf Winne is also mentioned in the foreword. Okay, maybe I misremembered this. But yeah, um, Elf Winne is um, an Anglo-Saxon um, king, I think. Is he a king? Elf Winne, Winne born Anglo-Saxon around um, 869 um, AD, living in Great Britain during the 10th century. However, um, yeah, Elf Winne then went into a boat and he found a straight road to, um, to, to, to the West Continent, Amman. You look here at the thing. It was practical, I have it here. So it's a first age map, but it doesn't matter. Here we have the West Continent, Amman. That's the first age map, though. Where's my second age map? Oh, here's the second age map. So he... The, the Amman was later moved away from the world. Basically, when the world, when the oceans became bent with the downfall of Numinor, I wasn't always imagined that the world was bent, but Amman was basically staying where it was before. And we had to take a special road that was a straight road that did was also not bent and basically connected the world with Amman. I also imagine that Amman was moved into the unseen. So you, if you look up into the sky, you don't see a gigantic flying continent at the sky, but um, it was put into the unseen. And I don't know, I think I have somewhere um, a thing where you can kind of see it. Yeah, something like this. So it was gone. And then there in the west, a new continent was that is potentially then America, but that's a, a different topic. However, Elf Winne found this straight road, which the elves also use in the Third Age to get, for example, to Amman. And um, he found this and went to Tol Eresea, this little island in front of Amman, and then met the elves there. And the elves told them the story of what happened in the past, the law basically we know from Tolkien, and then he brought it back at some point to, um, he translated it and brought it back to um, to our world. And this is, I assume the, the idea is that Tolkien find or found the um, the, the stuff of um, Elf Winne and translates it into our language. Kind of. Or the like the translations, like Elf Winne translates it, he's an Anglo-Saxon, so he translates it into Old English and Tolkien translates it from Old English to English. Basically, that is kind of um, the way. And keep in mind that originally the whole Numinor and so on stuff has to do with Atlantis and so on and so forth. So it's it's a com this is definitely a thing. Uh, the Book of Lost Tales world looks like a ship, as Tolkien drew it. Yeah. <laughs> C 
Zephyr um, Optional says, um, Elf winner in the story of the cottage of lost play is the story that connects Middle Earth to our world. Yeah. There's also an interview from the 60s where Tolkien basically, um, somebody asked, I think it was like, he asked uh, question, uh, answered questions of, for example, children and so on. I think it was a y- at least a young, or in, in the, the question, I forgot how it was worded exactly. Would have to look into this again. But it was basically asked, what is in the Far East or in the Far South and so on? And he said, yeah, Africa, Japan, China, something like this. So Tolkien also hints at this um, here and there in this particular interview, that how the worlds are connected with each other. This is kind of, though, lost in the Silmarillion and the published Silmarillion that is and so on. You have to kind of look quite deep into these ideas and elements to to really find connections there. You could make an argument, of course, if you look into the early into the book called History of Middle uh, of the History of the Hobbit. There in there's a version of this book that includes um, his draft text of the Hobbit. And that includes some very funny uh, or interesting references to our world. That Tolkien later removed, though, from the Hobbit publication, but um, it is. Let me just see if I find it, actually. History of the Hobbit. Um, for example... There were still some people in those days who were or who had both elves and heroes of um, the Norse for ancestors and Elrond, the master of the house, was one. He was as good to look at almost as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves and as kind as Christmas. <laughs> so where we have the Christmas reference... There's another one, I can't, I forgot how it was exactly, but there's um, also... a reference to a specific kind of ponies. No, it it was not the ponies, it were the, the wild wireworms. Tell me that you uh tell me what you want me to do and I will try it if I have to walk from here to the last desert in the east and fight the wild wireworms of the Chinese. So yeah, something like this is also there. It's where there was also some pony reference to China or something like this. I forgot what it was. But yeah, you definitely, in these very, very old um, texts, you kind of find this, Bruno. In an earlier draft, by the way, the text was, um, if I have to walk from here to the great desert of Gobi and find the wild worms of the Chinese. So we all even have the, the desert Gobi in it and so on. So Tolkien uh, made it in very early writings of The Hobbit much closer to our world. But it goes... Um, Yeah, yeah, umbrellas, golf. In a picture, um, there's also a. However, it's pronounced in English. Wait. Barometer. That's how I pronounce it. 
Um, you, you see this and a and a and a clock, a Swiss clock. Is there a Swiss clock also mentioned in the draft? And the the reference to golf is also still in Tolkien that actually survived. That um. in the hobbit let me just read it uh, he charged the ranks of the goblins of mount garam in the battle of the green fields and knocked their king's golf golfimbuls head clean off with a wooden club it sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole and this way the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment so <laughs> that's actually how it's phrased in the Robert, uh, in the Hobbit. Golfimbo is an interesting name, though. I think in one of my last videos about the history of Elrond, we also discuss this a moment and look into old Norse roots of this world. Yeah, there's also reference to a train. I'm going to try to find it, but I don't find it. Like, I can't find it right now, but there was like a, a also mention No, it's it's not in the Hobbit. Even it's in 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 the um in the Lord of the Rings. I think it's in the draft, or is it in the version? I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think. Well, let me just. Double check if this is right and don't want to talk nonsense here. No, there is a, there's a leftover even in the ho in the Lord of the Rings. It's not in the Hobbit. The dragon passed like an express train, turned a somersault, and burst over bywater with a deafening explosion. So here we have the ex express train. That is in chapter one, a long expected party in the Lord of the Rings. So this kind of survived the express train. Yeah, I could argue it's it's something the narrator says, but uh, it's it's kind of still uh, interesting nonetheless. I think that it's um, this it's still there. Oh yeah, that's true. Also, the map also has a note for miles, a latitude of Jerusalem, and also mentions Cyprus. Yeah. So kind of interesting and um, there's of course also um um some some historic things from uh Tolkien Let's see if I find it. Uh, 
But yeah, in the um, chapters um, that describe the Siege of Gondor and so on, if you would analyze it for terminology that is also kind of connected to World War One, you definitely would find a lot of stuff like this. But this is more um, a meta level on, on Tolkien as a writer, I think. But you read, for example, the term trench, you read a lot. You even find terms like missiles and so on in, in these texts, actually. It's kind of interesting. Um, Annika from um, the German Tolkien Society, I th she's like a historian, and she wrote like um, a scientific uh, work analyzing these chapters in context of World War I. It's kind of interesting. I have not read it yet, but um, the topic I think is very interesting. Always need to ask her to send me her, her work. It would be really interesting to see that, I have to admit. But yeah, it's um, yeah. Appendix F, I think also you're right. Uh, might hint at why some explanation and expressions were used. Speaking of appendices, um, Joe also asks, Appendix A seems to say if Elrond's sons don't depart with him, then they become mortal, since they are not mentioned on the ship with Frodo. I assume they remind behind as mortals. This is correct. I think we don't really know how they would decide at the end, because it seems they are even long after um, Frodo is gone. There are other ships going back to um, the West Continent, Aman. So... From this perspective, it's possible that one of them or both of them also decide to 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 be counted towards the elves and sail to the west continent. But um, of course, it is difficult to uh, to answer. Like we don't know. I think there's no clear thing. I could also imagine because there's this oh, I I called it before like the duality of the half elven that one half elven always decides to become to be counted towards men, and the other decides to be counted towards elves, like El Elrond and Elros and so on. It um, could be re reflected by his sons as well, in a way, in a, in a way. I mean, Arwen already decided to stay in Middle-earth, so maybe, who knows? Why did the level of technology akin to the Middle Age not develop for over 6,000 years? It's, it's a topic we often discussed like in the past. It's a bit difficult to answer, but I think you, you could also make the argument that the development of mankind when it comes to their technology and knowledge is not a, a straight line that goes up all the time. There are also some ditches somewhere. If you think, for example, ancient Egypt, they built somehow the pyramids. And look at Egypt now. You, you definitely see, like, um, development is not a straight line. And, or our world. Like, how long, not, not even, like, it's very uh, unfair phrase. Not look at Egypt now, look at Egypt in the last... 2,000 years or so. Or look at our world. Like, you, you could say, yeah, mankind at one point knew how to build pyramids, but why did it take us thousands of years to um, get there? When the Isn't there also not the story that when the Romans, basically when their empire kind of ceased to exist, the Roman Empire at its height, they lost the knowledge of how to make very good concrete, and it took, like, a thousand years to rediscover it or do something similar again. Like you, you always have these weird um, digits in in like development, due to wars, due to weird um, um, conf inner conflicts in in places, due to let's say um, fanatic ideas, due to strange rulers of your country and so on. It can 
easily happen that things get lost, especially in a time where people um, have problems to basically keep their knowledge. When you have a population that, for example, can't write or read, then it's very difficult to um, keep knowledge how to build a computer or something like that. You know what I mean? Like if you, the more complex things you want to build, the better your infrastructure for knowledge has to be. And as soon as this infrastructure gets damaged in some way, like a big library starts burning and suddenly a lot of knowledge is lost and either you, the people who know about it write it down again or you are kind of, next generations are kind of screwed. And that I think is something that's often um, underestimated uh, in, in a way. Ancient Persian um, societies um, had uh, underground air conditioning systems that we, we can't um, do today, yeah. And I also post the um, quote here too. It sounds like they would have to be on the same ship as him, but it seems Tolkien, it seems like Tolkien interpreted it differently as uh, per buff, yeah. But yeah, there are definitely some examples of societies that existed that had an incredibly high and then vanished for whatever reason. And then people were less knowledgeable. That's also like, I don't know, 2000 years, if you think about it. If you look just 100 or let's say 150 years back into, if you go 150 years back into the past, the world also seemed far less knowledgeable. It, it almost seems like in the last 100 years, mankind, or 150 years or something, the mankind has like gathered an absurd amount of knowledge in a very short time versus the knowledge gathered in all the thousands of years of mankind before. Like, you have to consider that mankind, um, I don't know, the first human, um, humans or so, um, I don't know, I was in a museum once about in, in uh, here in Germany, in Neanderthal, in Metman. Um, I should know the exact numbers, but I forgot. But it's like 120 to 200,000 years ago. There's, it's a very, very long time. And if you consider from where they started and how long it took them to get anywhere, it's quite, quite a long time, it seems. And on top of that, if we... Um, go back here on our map and look the look at the first age map a center of knowledge and kind of technology where men lived for a few hundred years and kind of the young men like mankind as 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 a young um folk it, with the elves they kind of strived there and then uh, beleriand got completely destroyed in for in the second age let me see if I have my second age map here. And they kind of um, lost everything. And then a lot of knowledge went to Numenor. And then uh, Numenor was destroyed.
and um, the the remnants of knowledge or so was then with with Gondor later. And even they had not access to all the technology Numenor had over its time. So you could argue, like in some versions, Numenorians had airships and stuff like that. So it is um, well, it's very early versions to be fair, but it's um, it is very interesting to see that um, you know there are definitely reasons why knowledge of of men were were kind of lost a lot of times. There were a lot of wars going on. You had a crazy dark lord that consistently or two dark lords consistently trying to take over the world. Stuff like that kind of diminished this um, approach. Then you had the elves and the alliances between men and elves, and they kind of strived and could live in peace. So, but but these times were often relatively short, and then a big devastation came again, and people had to start building everything up from scratch again. I think this kind of resets often their their technology advancement. On top of that, I think Tolkien definitely wanted to not focus um, But the question is, in Tolkien's world, do, did they already reach the full knowledge of the of the of of the Middle Age of the of the med medieval times? Like people also used swords and weapons like that in in, in antiquity. That's of course also not six thousand years ago, but definitely several thousand years ago. And you could argue that in some areas you could say that the standard citizen in medieval times was he living a better and more modern technology uh, life from a technology perspective than people in ancient Greece. It's definitely a question um, you need to consider. I think it's always a thing from, from perspective, right? And on top of that, I think tech, the, the technology advancement of technology is not a topic that Tolkien really um, wants to invest inside his writings or in his world. That's also the reason why the Numenorians have no airships. They said, yeah, that would be too much. We, they don't need that much technology. They just need to be advanced to sail and so on. Lobelia had an umbrella, but then it had to be invented in the 1600s. Yeah, like, <laughs> I was surprised them they didn't invent guns, but in very early versions they um, had guns, like the Numenorians, but Tolkien nerfed them, as we um, video gaming people um, would say. Farmer Gals had a blunderbuss. But yes, um, it's always difficult to discuss thing. It's definitely strange, but I don't have a good answer for, for this. But I think we often maybe also underestimate a bit our the, the time and the, the knowledge of times and um, how long it sometimes took to develop stuff. The Numenor was the last story in the Legendarium in the early 1930s. The Numerians were very advanced and their survivors left behind traces of European mythology. Yeah, that's that's a thing, right? It's kind of the idea of Atlantis that Tolkien took there. They had this very advanced island and it just went over and it became a legend and maybe spawned traces, as you say, of mythology and so on. 
if it ever existed, of course. But yeah, it's it's an interesting um, idea of, often that there's some place that existed and then a huge catastrophe destroys it and removes it from the world and only traces of legends are kind of left. It's kind of a common theme that Tolkien also found very interesting. I mean, Tolkien's idea was to write a time travel story originally, and then it has led to him writing a story about Atlantis and Numenor that developed into a Numenor, and yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very interesting story. I think the tech level was um, around Beowulf, before plate mail 1300 ish. Definitely possible. Though, if you look, come back to the question with um, traces of uh, the real world, we have the Elf Wiener, and Elf Wiener, like the, the events of the, of the mythology happening in Middle Earth, happened. A long time before Elf Winne. and Elf Winne lived. We can um, we can read about. He was a Anglo-Saxon prince from 869 A.D. So very early on, and the events he learned about must have been even older. We could even talk about this was pre-antiquity or so. It is. It could be very very ancient. What also seems very interesting to me is that ancient languages often are very complicated. Like if you look at Latin or Old Norse or so, very, very complicated languages. And the modern versions of these languages became much, much easier in many ways. So maybe making it easier to communicate, more efficient to communicate, also has to do with... Um, advancement of of humanity if that makes sense i guess the the language of humanity started very primitive and then got more and more complicated but was very inefficient and then it got more efficient again so at least my kind of idea how it could work Of course, we also see complicated languages existing still today, and they're doing just fine. But, um, yeah. <laughs> I only see it, for example, in my own language, in, in German. We have, like, only four ca grammatical cases in our language. When you compare this to Old Norse or Polish or so, or Russian, uh, Russia, um, the Russian language, you you have more i think you have much more cases or even icelandic or something like that it's really complicated language so it's relatively close to the original and i for example see that in some in many ways we in germany see tendencies that some cases are used less and less and are replaced with other cases even though some people say oh no that's ruining the german language but it's an interesting tendency if if, if that makes sense It's exactly what's what I mean, like the how people converse with in their their slang, if that makes sense. And suddenly things become much more easier to say. But it had to be after Bronze Age, and it's two, uh, still two thousand years. Yeah, yeah, for for sure, it could be, but it's really difficult to tell how how old the stuff is. Like what what other measurements and ideas we have for for that like why couldn't there be a peak in the pre-antiquity where people got to a really high level like the gondorians 
from their technology and then the Gondorians, I don't know, died out or whatever and then their knowledge was lost. Like, was the downfall of the Roman Empire or something like that. To this day, we still see in some places here the aqueducts and so on, um, the ruins of those. So the advancement that the Romans brought in at some point kind of, um, yeah, were loosed yes, less and less and so on, depending on the state of the Roman Empire. And if it vanishes or is diminished, then it can have also like a negative eff effect on, on stuff. The, the, you just have to construct a world, like in Tolkien's case, where these dim this fallen empire idea just repeats so often that they simply can't progress out of their Bronze Age technology, if that makes sense. Or Iron Age technology. That is true, like you, losing technology is, in my opinion, difficult these days, but it's not difficult if only very few people know something. And the more specific and more advanced technology is, we see this today, we don't have these general um, scholars anymore that know everything, like, like Mars and physics and biology and so on, and language and, uh, I don't know, philosophy. For everything, even inside these disciplines, we have like specifications, like somebody only knows, um, I don't know, quantum physics, the other per person is expert in astrophysics. And even in these disciplines, they are also experts. One only knows about, I don't know, protostars, and the other is more in the theoretical realm of um, black holes and equations and whatnot in theoretical physics there. It's, it just becomes very specific, same in computer science. There are people working on quantum computers, there are other people's working on AI, there are other people's working on I don't know what. And yeah, Da Vinci, for example, did everything, or same with Leibniz or so. And um, I think this is bec like the more advanced the technology is, the more specific I think it becomes, and it more knowledge, like it's, it's a knowledge pyramid. At the beginning, it's very broad, but it gets steeper and steeper, and you need many of these pyramids for the different disciplines, if that makes sense. While the fundament of them kind of can be the same. I'm not sure if that's a good analogy. Probably it's a terrible one, but you know what I mean, I hope. <laughs> In the case of the Roman Empire, the eastern half continued for a thousand years. Yeah. The Middle East and China were doing okay as well, for sure. But then, um, I mean, China is a very strange example. It's also like a high culture, very advanced at many times in their history. And then there were also times when they say their advancement, they kind of lost track of their um, advancement. Let's put it that way. And now they are kind of back on track again, but still behind, even though like, I guess China 2000 years ago or something was potentially more advanced than people in Europe. Like the point is, we can, you now can discuss like 5000 different examples, but I think the point is that advancement in humanity for humanity is not like a straight line. It not goes always up. It always goes down at times. Not always, but often. And only now that we have like this massive information infrastructure, we live in a time where losing knowledge is almost unthinkable because our infrastructure for keeping knowledge is, and our technology for keeping knowledge is so advanced. Like we can read and write. I can discuss with you other people sitting on all around the world. We had a person here at the beginning, maybe still there, shout outs to him. Um, from South Africa. Um, I know that some people look from Australia here um, sometimes a stream or from England, from the United States. I live here in Germany. In the cent like We can just communicate and discuss this. And when the stream is over, you can watch it tomorrow again or next week again or in 
when, when, when YouTube is in 50 years still around, you can watch it in 50 years again if you want. It's kind of not lost. That is kind of very impressive in of itself. But when you only have like five scholars who know something and then they get killed in a war, then yeah, <laughs> and, and the library gets burned, then you're kind of screwed. I think. Especially if you, um, if, if for example, a war happens or something happens that's so devastating that your complete infrastructure is destroyed to a level where this specific knowledge isn't even needed anymore because you need to focus rebuilding for 100 years on other things, then you kind of, um, I think, that is, I think, the points where stuff gets lost. It's not only that the empire just peacefully vanishes, it's often, I, I assume, also connection with war, with crisis, with um, civil wars and so on, where people just have other worries than keeping knowledge. I think then it can easily happen that knowledge is lost. In Cosmos, um, Sagan refers to the destruction of the Library of Alexandria as the greatest loss of knowledge in history. Yeah, when I said that um, a library got burned, I also thought about the um, destruction of the, uh, the Library of uh, Alexandria. Yeah, it's a pretty cool thought that we have so much fun listening to, or listen, you listening to me, I have to read what you say. <laughs> While your household chores. And it's always interesting to see um, where people are from. But yeah, it's um, it's pretty cool. However, to some of this stuff, Texas. <laughs> That's also, I, I assume it's pretty warm in Texas right now. <laughs> so not don't want to switch places with you right now. Yeah, that's actually a good um, example by Mark. She's the old techniques, methods of handwerk, trade in English, so craftsmanship or whatever, um, are being lost today constantly because those who know them get old and no one learns them. That's, that's a good example. Same with some um, regional languages like Plattdeutsch or something like this. Also, slowly has lesser and lesser speakers because nobody needs it anymore, learns it anymore. People only learn it out of tradition and people... Um, who kind of are able to speak it, are not that well versed in it, and slowly, you know, it gets lost. Same in, as he said, handwerk, the craftsmanship. Um, that can build certain things, for example. Suddenly, it's not needed anymore. It's not an attractive job anymore. People, they, they have trouble finding um, new pupils for this. And so um, the practical knowledge of doing this, and there's sudden, suddenly there's no teacher anymore that can teach you that. Of course, there might be written down knowledge for it. But um, yeah, <laughs> in a basement is probably the best uh, place to be, I think, when it's very warm outside. But yeah, it's a very good example. So, chat, I think nobody knows Fortran anymore, I <laughs> said. <laughs> oh, man.
I don't know, it's kind of practice, but I also think I'm kind of bad at keeping up with chat. I often feel like I miss so many um, cool messages in chat. And we are just only a few people here and they're still not able to keep up at times. But it's very difficult to read and talk at the same time. It's even more difficult to um, yeah, look something up while talking. I'm not very bad at this. So I think I was much worse when I started and it got better over time because I have like a few years practice in this by now. And I also have to do production at the same time. That's the worst part, which I am um, slacked a little bit um, today. You say slack if you do something not like only half as good. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. Okay, Chad. I have a question. Okay, that's maybe okay. Do you prefer the Lost Tales version where um, Elfwine sails from Britain to Tol Eresia or the one um, where Tol Eresia is literally the British Isles and Ereol sails there from um, Helgoland? I think the first one. I, I like the idea that... Um, so I think both versions have their interesting um, kind of idea. But yeah, the first one, I think it's kind of cooler because he sails out of the world into, you know, uh, to, to, to this distant, removed land. <laughs> I bet I remember my brilliant question right after you end the stream. Well, you can write it in the comments or so. And people can also press a like button here if they want. If you uh, remember it, then I maybe talk about this next time or so. And then I will forget it, for, of course, but then at least you have written it down. I just answer it in the comments, probably the easiest thing. So yeah, that would be the version I think I like more, a bit more. My question, though, is I have I know it's not that many people still here listening to my nonsense, but um, we we have, of course, an interesting reason to make um, a poll again. I know what, what options I should make. I'll just give you three options, whatever. Was well, such a niche, niche 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 question? I doubt I remember it. Again, I'm always up for who's the best elf and why is it Finrod Filagund? Well, <laughs> the question is the Gollum. Let's play. That's kind of a like that's kind of a problematic thing. Gilgayar uh, earlier asked, "What will be the next law video?" I don't know yet. In theory, it would be the next episode of the Gollum Let's Play, to be fair. A 
I like your commentary, but I don't like the game. The problem is a little bit with this Let's Play. Like, if we look at the numbers, on the first episode, I got massive 723 views. On the second, massive 336 views. So half of that what I got before. I have to admit, it's a game I'm also on Snow Warning's side. Um, I'm not the hugest fan of the game myself. I think they did do some, some stuff decent and treat the law with some respect, I feel. <laughs> Bilic. But the game itself is not very great. Like, it has too many issues. It's a classic 4 out of 5, uh, 4 out of 10 game. It's, uh, yeah, it's just below average in every respect. If I would get massive views on this Let's Play, I would definitely find the energy to make this. But seeing that it takes some time to produce this, I have to look up the law, I have to look out for the quotes that sometimes I add into these videos and so on. It's quite a bit of work to make an episode like that. And then it's watched by 300 people. That kind of is like um, hurting a little bit my motivation, <laughs> let's put it that way. That's also why I currently struggle p putting out these episodes. So I'm still not sure what I um, should do with, with this Let's Play. I feel like, should I waste... Waste is a, is a too heavy word for this, but should I put in too much effort into this and continue with this or shall I also put it on the back burner and say well when I feel like it I make another episode everything by the way of the Gollum Let's Play is recorded uh, the whole playthrough I have recorded I also have to do the commentary I do the commentary um, not live because I'm terrible at playing and commenting on law stuff at the same time especially when you have to look up stuff or so so I can prepare a little bit for what is in the episode And that worked fairly well production-wise. That's also the reason why there are no subtitles. Well, I basically watch, I edited the footage and talk over it and, yeah, kind of try to make this as good as possible. Um, the problem is, it seems like nobody wants to see it. I know some people here like it, and feedback on it was also positive. But, um, yeah, we often had the discussion of my main channel currently not doing too well. That's also a reason why I feel like, okay, when the main channel is not doing well, and I, there's nothing I can really do about it, except even if I put out classic law content, people don't seem to want to watch my videos, it seems. Um, then I felt like, yeah, maybe I should focus a bit on video games this year, because there's a lot of interesting um, stuff coming out. And that kind of motivates me, if that makes sense. <laughs> I can't believe your channel doesn't have 1 million subscribers. Well, there's only space for 1 million subscriber lo uh, Lord channel, that's Nerd of the Rings, so there's no... I think there it will take a very long time for any other channel to reach this number that does mainly all rings law. Like YouTube has in some areas its favorites and those favorites uh, YouTube pushes then a lot. And of course there's also reason for this because Matt does fantastic work on his channel so it's not like it's not deserved or anything. It's just, you know, yeah, it's difficult to get this. But um, yeah, it's, what can I say? It's, it's sometimes YouTube is weird and uh, I don't know. Currently, Is a golem game too difficult or and is it too linear? I think it's not really difficult. It is sometimes not well designed. And it's 
also very linear, I would say, even though it has some decisions you can make that have some impact on which character survives or not or so. So um, there are some possibilities. I also started the sentence with, I already recorded this. If you want to see, if you can't wait for Gollum, let's f to see the whole Gollum um, playthrough. I have it upload, like I, I um, basically played through the game on Twitch completely. And there's a playlist with my pledge uh, and in, in parallel, I locally recorded the footage for the let's play on YouTube, the edited one. And if you want to um, see this, there's like three videos, it's actually 18, over 18 hours, but it's a lot of talking in between. So keep this in mind. I can link you the stuff here in the, in, in the channel if you want to see the whole thing. The lore talk there is not that deep though, because it was just more for me playing through the game, researching, seeing what's in there mainly recording. This is on the uh, Twitch archive channel I have. The first episode though is on the main channel because we did this live here in the live stream on the main channel. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, um, I kind of get this that um, I don't expect crazy numbers on the, on the Let's Play, but I have like a, a YouTube channel with 45,000 subscribers and it hurts a bit when you see only 300 of those 45,000 people. Most of them watch my channel for law stuff, are not even interested to, uh, in to watch uh, an episode of that. It would be different, like let's say the first episode got 10,000 views when it, the game came out and I made the first episode of that, even though I was very late with the first episode to be, to be fair. If that would be the case, and then the second episode got 1,000 views or 300 or whatever, I know, okay, people watched the first episode, decided it's not for me. So, you know, but I don't know. The first episode also did not do well. Let's put it that way. Nice Randu is some. Oh, thank you. I thought um, one of my most successful streaming VODs has um, Thranduil uh, in the thumbnail. So I thought, let's go with him again, even though we didn't talk about him. Though I always find he's an interesting character. He also appears in the Gollum game, interestingly. <laughs> if if, De if a Deagle had gone fishing alone, how would have that changed history? Just kidding, yeah. <laughs> I'm here for the Tolkien law. These law Q and A is super good content. Thank you, much appreciated. Well, I guess it would just have influenced uh, Deagle instead of Smeagol. So I guess Deagle then becomes Gollum, kind of. <laughs> A different version of Gollum, but I could imagine that. Of course, in my heart, I hope that the game was like kind of a hidden gem, if that makes sense. But unfortunately, it was uh, not really a hidden gem. <laughs> I forgot who Deag Deagle actually found it. Deagle. I wonder if a co-op game, Gollum and Aragorn, would have been more fun. Probably not. I think the idea behind the game is not bad. It's just needed better execution and more focus on interesting stuff. That's the biggest problem. The game, there's too much stuff in the Gollum game that's not interesting, unfortunately. 
What are you drinking? It's your brilliant question. Um, currently, water with um, what do you call it when um, it sparkles? <laughs> do you call it sparkling water? I don't know. Something like this. Usually, I drink tea, but currently, it's too hot for tea for me personally. So I drink just water. I'm very simple in uh, that. Carbonated, yeah, that's probably a better thing. Sounds like something carbonated, yeah, carbonated water. I even have a thing that uh, can carbonate water in the kitchen. Uh, to, I've, actually, it's a good question. We had one day here where it got close to 30 degrees, but currently it's a bit cooler again. So we have like, I don't know, 22 or something like that. Let me just check what is the weather tomorrow. Twenty six degrees is the temperature here tomorrow. Today was only twenty two. So I was right, kind of. Maybe I didn't even say twenty two, I'm not sure, but I wanted to say twenty two. So something around these lines. It's actually pretty manageable I currently. It's not too bad. Thirty is too much, or thirty two or something. That's just crazy. Keep in mind that for me personally my ideal temperature is like I don't know. 16 degrees Celsius or so <laughs> for outside that is It's kind of interesting. Did you like the Gollum Let's Play? 50% said or half of people said at least a bit 37% said yeah, I liked it and 12% uh, even said no, I didn't like it it's like 110 in Texas. <laughs> Just, what is 110 in Celsius? I like. I have no feeling for Fahrenheit to Celsius. It sounds like a lot. I think above 100 Fahrenheit is quite a bit, right? It's 43. Oh. <laughs> That's insane. I don't want to ever. I don't live um, in the 43 Celsius realm. <laughs> that sounds like death. Have you ever dived, uh, delved into Tolkien's various description of the eyes of his characters, different colors, internal lights, spark, uh, sparks from the eyes? It's an interesting topic. I have to admit, no, not really. Like I know they exist, of course, and I stumbled upon them and maybe appreciated them here and there. But it's not like out of my head I can tell you all the different colors um, of eye colors of characters and descriptions of them. It's definitely um, I'm not that uh, too deep into this. Lots of gray eyes. Yeah, that is true. Temp brackets are currently being broken all around me because I live in a fog pocket. So I'm very grateful right now. I can imagine. But yeah, still don't know. I hope, like, currently I feel like um, I still have the Who is Elrond episode 9 that needs to be done. So Gilgayar asked like three hours ago. <laughs> What will be the next law video? And um, since I already know it's part 10, actually, <laughs> part 9 is already there, right? Yeah, part 9 exists. That's about Erebor and the war of the Rohirrim. Part 10 is then the era after that. I still worked, I already worked on this, but then I got distracted by other things. And yeah, we still have to finish that stuff.
but currently, yeah, it, it's kind of strange a bit. I feel like people might um, here, on, especially on the channel, be a bit sad that the last few weeks or even like two months or so were a bit lacking when it comes to content. But um, from my perspective, it feels like I've done like a ton of content. Like look at this um, video, for example, on the gaming channel. Let's hope the bot works. It works. It's like a f it's like 46 minutes long this video already. It took a long time to make. I know that most of you people are um, probably not deep enough into gaming that you are interested in uh, a video like this, but that was definitely um, one I worked quite a bit on. And I, that's also a project I didn't expect many views because when I wanted to make this video, um, when this was a big topic that would have gotten some traffic, I got sick and I couldn't make the video. And so I made it now, two months too late or something like this. And that is potentially why it won't get many views. It's not not big of a problem. Like the last few videos on the main channel got quite a few views. So I'm happy with that. I also made like a video about what will be in the um, upcoming Cyberpunk expansion, which also want to cover this time, if it's at least not an absolute catastrophe. And that's also over like half an hour long or so. As a result, um, As a result, um, yeah, it like there's definitely content just on the gaming channel this time around, and it. I have to admit, like I did, especially um, when the uh, show was running last year, I did so much content, and I continued doing um, quite a bit of um, difficult to make content as well, with some very specific edge cases we covered and so on, and this year didn't treat me, in uh, my opinion. <laughs> my personal opinion too well so it always felt a bit like um, everything felt a bit like it's on the back burner right now so I can I, I started focusing on some other stuff and I have to admit doing some other stuff from time to time felt also kind of great like you could maybe argue maybe I burned is my bit uh, myself a bit out from all the talking content in a way even though, of course, I still have huge passion for Tolkien and his books and his writings. But I also have a huge passion for video games. And 2023 is really a crazy video game year. A lot of crazy stuff is currently happening. So that is a bit why my focus is this year more on video game stuff and content. And I feel like I want to push my video, my second channel a little bit. That is uh, currently um, a reason why there is... Um, very little stuff going on um, on this channel, which I want to change though, because I know a lot of people expect um, cool content here as well. And I tried it with the um, Gollum uh, content, but um, the Gollum content, it is really... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. The Gollum, uh, as we just discussed, the Gollum content seems to be not that popular here on this channel. Like, I can't activate people that usually watch my content to watch it and I can't activate obviously no people um, outside that are not even interested in like there are not many people interested in the Gollum game it seems I hoped that maybe the law anal analysis aspect for the Gollum game um, let's play might interest more people here on the channel but it seems currently like the numbers are so bad that <laughs> it just feels like okay it's it's a bit unfortunate so I hate stopping projects, but sometimes you have to put stuff like on the back burner. <laughs> the folk of the hammer, um, Russ and Gondolin, had sparks flying from their eyes as they defended the city. Love description. That's really cool. 
Yeah, Tombomid had blue eyes. I agree. That's true. Columns were green. Dreamers were bleary. Interesting. I don't play, but I love watching and um, learning about them. Just open your Cyberpunk video for later. Yeah, much appreciate here the, that you uh, enjoy at least the content here. I have no experience with the cyberpunk genre, apart from a few um, sessions of Shadowrun, TTRP, the tabletop RPG, but your video about uh, made it sound interesting. Thanks, much appreciate it. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's not that interesting, because in this past tracing video, it's, abo it's about basically the graphics of the game and the new rendering mode they, um, for demonstration's sake, added to the game. Never played any Lord of Rings games. What's the best one? That's a good question. I would say War in the North is pretty good. It's a bit difficult to tell if it still holds up because video game development created further. And uh, if you read Neuromancer, I started reading Neuromancer when I did the cyberpunk video and wanted to include it, but it was too much work to also add um, this, uh, like, like put, put too much Neuromancer stuff into the um, video. So I put it also a bit on the back burner, but I want to make a new sub uh, video about the genre of cyberpunk, not the game um, at some point, maybe a second part where uh, we also talk a bit about Neuromancer. I have to say I liked, um, why do androids dream of electric sheep uh, better, though? It's more... The style of Neuromancer is very specific, but it's very important, of course. Especially um, Cyberpunk 2077, the game, is definitely all this. Cyberpunk is, is also like a tabletop thing in origin. Um, it's also very Neuromancer-inspired, I think. A Battle for Middle-Earth, yeah. Also a classic, um, the, the the Battle for Middle-Earth games are strategy games. I think they are also pretty pretty cool. But they are, I think these days, kind of difficult to get because um, it's an EA game and EA does not have the, um, the Lord of Rings license anymore. So the game is not officially sold anymore. I think there are some ways you can get it, though. Oh, Noah is here. Hey, Chris, great to join. I'll bite uh, late. Also, the question, are you a full-time content creator? Currently, um, due to my channel not doing that much, I still spend most of my time, but I have some other projects to pay the bills, basically, that I do outside of content creation. But my uh, goal is, of course, like last year, for example, I was definitely doing this full-time, especially during the show was running and so on. And last year was also the most successful yet on this channel um, ever. But yeah, of course, when the when suddenly YouTube decides to cut your views out of for no apparent reason by half or so, you have to see how things work, right? I would recommend downloading Battle for Middle Earth legally. Too few copies. I, don't know. I think there is some way. Like you can download parts of it legally. I think or the first game. I don't know. There's also one and two. Both are pretty good. And what else is good? I would say Shadow of. If you, it depends a bit on how how well you can ignore strange changes to the law and how much you like the style of the game, but I also like Shadow of Mordor quite a bit. It's from its, let's say, development value relatively modern, but I think War in the North is also a pretty good um, um, game, but from, from its value, like it's more like a triple A game, so it's uh, in many ways pretty decent, though it has definitely also some flaws. Shadow of War is like an amped up version of Shadow of Mordor, but it's also, when it comes to lore, even more crazy. And for law, hardcore lore fans, it can, can be a bit annoying. That is pretty good. Currently, I'm also, that's a Magic the Gathering Lord of the Rings um, edition. I haven't tried that out yet. I think Nerd of the Rings has covered it a little bit on his channel. 
So maybe check there if you want to learn about that. You can also play this Magic the Gathering as a classical trading card game. But you can also play it online. As, um, it's called a Magic MT MTG Magic the Gathering um, Arena, I think it's a game called. I think that's also in Battle for Middle Earth. One is better than two because you can mend the walls. Yeah, that is... Uh, that's some sp I think m most people prefer one, right? I'm not sure. But I think two was also pretty decent. But I also only played it more casually, I think. I also, I think I even played it co-op with a friend, if I remember correctly. And I also found very fun. We could have had a lot of options there, but unfortunately the games are all olden by now. The Gollum game, unfortunately, I can't recommend, as said in the review. Is there anything else? Um, if you like MMORPGs, so with other players and so on, maybe check out Lord of the Rings Online. I think, for example, Men of the West also does some Lord of the Rings Online content at times. There's some other channels who also play it. Do you have videos of you playing Shadow of Mordor and War, uh, War in the North? No, I only made like a lore comparison. That was one of my first breakthrough vid videos here on the channel 2017 about Shadow of Mordor. And then I made later one about Shadow of, um, Shadow of War as well. War in the North was always requested that I play it here on stream uh, or on my Twitch channel or so. But I never did because I often, I don't know, there are so many games on my list I want to play. Return of the King and slash Third Age on GameCube back in the day. Yeah, that was also... I mean, these were all the EA games. Kind of interesting that EA made so many good games back in the day or published so many big Lord, good Lord of the Rings games in the day. That was your grandfather's name. Which name was your grandfather's name? Aldor. Ah, oh, okay. And uh, what's one ring? Uh, what is the one one ring pr presents? You mean like in the allegory sense? I mean, of course, Tolkien always says that he doesn't like allegory, but I don't know. I would go with Tolkien's explanation of uh, the machine, basically the concept of taking a shortcut to power, and this shortcut can corrupt people. Yes, the machine, exactly. And this machine also can lead to the destruction of nature and so on. There's an interesting interview with um, his son, Christopher Tolkien, who um, explains this concept of the machine a little bit, I think. It's on YouTube. I think you just have to search for Christopher Tolkien interview or something like this. It's an old, it's a very old one, though. Christopher Tolkien interview. Let me see if it appears there. There's even a compilation of interviews. Christopher Tolkien speaks about the Silmarillion. There must be some of those.
Yeah, unchecked technology. Kind of is what Tolkien tried to describe with that. A good old machine. Very interesting. I think what's that's basically what the ring tries to demonstrate in a very drastic way. Like you get the ring and then suddenly you get super powerful. Especially if you are super powerful, and then at the end though it corrupts you and um, it doesn't bring you anywhere. I've always felt Tolkien's works are about eternal themes rather than an allegorical vehicle. It's maybe a good way of um, phrasing it. There's an interview um, snippet from him. I think it was a radio interview or so, I'm not sure. And they're talking, even says there, yeah, he likes driving um, his car and so on. And people were really surprised when he, they heard Tolkien saying this. Read a snow crash. The problem with cyberpunk books and films and so on, they're always kind of a bit depressing in a, in a way. So you have to be really in the mood for them. But um, yeah, that is basically, I think we slowly can end the stream. I mean, it's just three and a half hours, but that's usually, I think, a good length to aim for. There's a lot of eternal themes. Main one is probably good versus evil, yeah. Friendship, loyalty, sacrifice, hope, etc. Yeah. Very uh, important. It was a nice stream. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you all the people. Shoutouts to Aris Aurelian, Noah, and all the other people here in chat. Of course, also those uh, with memberships and so on might appreciate it, especially when there seems to be a content drawn on this channel. But I said, um, there is content, it's just on another channel, not necessarily here. I still have some other gaming content planned currently that I would like to do. For example, um, a, a Cyberpunk 2077 mod highlight. So there are some people in the community who modify the game in different means and um, add things to it that are not in the game by default. And uh, yeah, it's, they're kind of pretty cool um, additions to the game, I have to admit. Like in one mod, you can use the, the, the train and drive through the city, which is not possible in the standard game. I would like to make a video highlighting some of the coolest stuff I have found so far. That would be maybe interesting. There's currently a lot of discussion going on about the acquisition of um, the company Activision Blizzard by Microsoft, who are the Xbox people that we discussed yesterday on Twitch and so on. Ending so soon. Yeah, it's relatively soon for my standards, I have to admit. But I felt like it's a, we reached a good point for an end. And I try to maybe stream in a week again to, to catch up a little bit. Then this also gives me the opportunity to work on some other stuff a little bit. After the stream, um, or I stream on Twitch, also a possibility, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I try to, because usually I want to tr stream twice a month. I did. I think I didn't stream last month, so that's kind of set for, for that. So I want to... Um, Bird lost its soul years ago. Yeah, that's true. So I have to admit, they kind of nailed Diablo 4 for the most part, I think. But how good it will be in the end, we will see when the seasons are... Season 1 is through, I think, but whatever. A different topic.
Oh, snow, snow crash isn't that pressing, or at least I don't remember it that way. That's good. But yeah, um, this is basically um, what you can expect. I want, I don't know what I do next. Either I give um, Gollum one more shot and see how the next episode is received. I, though I already know that it won't pull crazy views and I don't expect crazy views, but like a channel of my size, if I do law content, I definitely have certain expectations at some point. And yeah, some, it it feels like the, the, the Gollum uh, Let's Play so far did exceptionally poorly. Like it even uh, <laughs> was far below my lowest expectations. So yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. So maybe I try it with a classic law video next here on this channel. And that might discuss the time shortly before The Hobbit starts. So we discuss that time, I think. But still, I also have, as I said, some plans for the gaming channel as well. And currently, uh, I'm very motivated to make gaming content. That's just the reason. Like, I have a lot of internal desire to do that. And that helps making content a lot when you like it's, it's difficult to make content when you feel like i don't like the game nobody's watching it you know and you are not that mo then you're not that motivated even though i know people wrote very nice and positive comments on those videos and some people seem to really enjoy those it sometimes is a, i don't know a bit a bit difficult i would have loved a really good golem game and everybody praises it but unfortunately it's not that but I said, um, for people interested in that, there is a full Let's Play on the YouTube Archive channel of my Twitch streams. I can, uh, I'm not sure if it's still here linked. Nope. I posted here it a moment ago. I don't have it here anymore because I'm not smart at times. But you can just post it here again in, in chat. I can also link it in the comments or so uh, in the description for people who are interested in this. But yeah, um, enough talking, chat. I would say we slowly come here um, to the end of the stream. Finally found it. And yeah, shout outs to all your people. If you have seen this here live, maybe press a like button. If you have see this as a VOD, also press the like button and I would also appreciate some comments and so on. Maybe check my other stuff on this channel, the older stuff, maybe to find something you haven't seen yet. Next asset might be the, the video about the time shortly before The Hobbit starts. I'm not sure how far we will get until we reach Lord of the Rings and then we slowly end with this um, series and then continue with something else maybe as an interesting question if you have interesting questions in you didn't get the answer here write them in the comments and maybe i make even a standalone video out of it answering I, the idea answering co um, questions from the comments and make a video out of that is still something i also kind of like doing of course it depends on the question like if i find a question very interesting think, oh that's a good topic i would really like to do some research on that then I might make a video, but who knows? It's a little bit, of course, random, but whatever. You know what I mean. Okay, chat. Yeah, Max Schieser, gute Nacht. Nighty night. Bye, everyone. And ring the annoying bell. Exactly. <laughs> that also helps. I think most people here yeah, are subscribed anyway. So, again, sh huge shout outs to the artists, especially Kimberly80, which art we have seen today was a bit 
um, slow on um, the the what is it called the the uh, showing stuff in the in the channel and so on. Shoutouts to all the subscribers here on the membership people on the YouTube channel. The shoutouts to the membership people on Twitch, and so on. And uh, I would say we see you. I try to stream in a week or so again. So we see ourselves then. We'll just check the yeah. When you subscribe, you get notified. Maybe check the Discord or so. I'll post it there on on Twitter. So for those people interested in a new stream, there will be one this month for sure. Except something unforeseeable happens. But yeah, I would say have a fantastic rest of the day. Good night and see you people next time. Goodbye.